Well, good morning and welcome to Good Hope Baptist Church this morning. Um, the pastor is out of town. Um, we have a visiting speaker this morning, Brother Paul Whitten, which Paul's not really a visitor. Paul's like family. We were just reminiscing some good times in the past. Um, pray for him, and he has his whole family, his daughters, son-in-laws, grandkids, his wife, all of them here, and I'm really excited to um, spend some time with them this morning. Um, if you picked up your bulletin when you came in, there's a few things there to note. Um, the youth are beginning a program, or actually in a program, called um, Bible 101. And so they're working on um, breaking down the books of the Bible and learning and understanding what that's about and why that's about. You know, I was raised in church, been in church all my life. Um, but I was probably in my 20s or 30s before I realized that the Bible wasn't chronological. Isn't that a shame? I knew a lot. I was a Christian. But I didn't understand how it was put together. Actually, his dad probably helped me learn more about that than anybody ever did. But... um. We don't want our kids to grow up that way. We want them to grow up knowing how it's put together, why it's put together. You know, the Word of God is exactly what the name says. It's the Word of God. In our children's class, Kids Link, we also are taking them through the Bible. Now, we're taking them at a lower um, level, uh, actually a higher flight over, but we're, we're going through the books and giving them, you know, this is what this book was about. And we're learning verses of scripture. And we've been teaching kids a long time. But right now, the kids that we have, as few as they are, they're walking out of there with scripture in their minds that they can repeat weeks after, not the day of. We don't give them credit anymore if they quote it the same day. They got to quote it next week. So... You know, we're excited about what's happening in that, but we would love to have more um, come and join us. So youth, that's all on Wednesday night. Youth are upstairs. We're downstairs. We start at 7 o'clock. So, you know, got all that going on. And we have a new preschool program fixing to kick off, and it's going to start this coming Wednesday night. Um, Jasmine and Virginia are going to be leading that one and it's going to be for four to kindergarten okay or through kindergarten so you know if you got a, a young child and they don't just bring them on and we'll we'll find something there for them also women of joy the balance will be due February the 23rd for those of you that have signed up to go to that um, you can see Jamie, or you can talk to Lydia. Lydia can point you to Jamie. So, <laughs> unfortunately, Jamie's carrying most of the load of that, but thank you. Um, so, and we do have Sunday school every Sunday morning here in the sanctuary. Um, nobody knew that this morning, um, apparently. But anyhow, we have it every Sunday morning. You can come in here at 10 o'clock or... If you can't get here by then, if you let me know you want to join and you don't get bugged by me every week, I'll send you a Zoom link and you can um, Zoom. Um, so prayer request right quick. Um, talking to Miss Marie Economy, they have um, a son-in-law that is facing cancer treatment, stage three melanoma. Um, that, keep him in your prayers. Going to have a series of treatments for a year is what they're looking at and her daughter has a lungectomy um, coming up um, Renee um, just pray for them that's you know Bill and Marie they don't really have anything else to do but take care of their sick family you know they're they're fine but <laughs> they got a full plate and um, for such a time as this that's why we're here we're here to support one another I also remember Miss Lois McBrayer. Some of y'all remember Miss Lois. She sat right over here, 90 years old. She now lives in Cleveland. She's not a member of our church anymore, but she was so much of a member, she still is special. 
uh, she had a um, pacemaker installed on Wednesday. 90 years old. She's the first person in Cleveland to ever receive this type of pacemaker. It went in. They didn't even have to put her to sleep. They went in up like they do a heart cath. So I can't even imagine how that works. But, you know, 90 years old, and she's still just as spry as can be. She's a, they told her she couldn't go home alone. And she said, well, I'm not alone. She said, Jesus is always with me. <laughs> They didn't buy that the first time, but they did let her go home alone. So a lot to pray about. Um, some of you um, are aware my former boss has been going through a cancer um, journey, and um, she got a clear report this week that they had it was not there. Finally, with all the radiation and chemo. Um, so now pray for her body to heal from that radiation because it's weakened some muscle connections and stuff. And she's very active. I mean, she ran a half marathon through the woods last February. Um, can't do that right now. That included Cloudland Canyon staircase two times. So, you know, I can do the stairs here if you give me time. If you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And, um, and we'll get started. Our Father, we thank you so much for, for this day. Lord, the second day of a new year. How many of us didn't even dream that we'd ever see 2022? I can remember laughing about contracts that were going out into 2005. And here we are looking backwards at all of that. Lord, you're a great God, and you love us so much. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Lord, what can we do for you? That's the question. What would you have us do? Not to earn anything but your approval. Not to win our way to heaven because we can't receive that gift that was given and take it fully in that's what we need to do father i thank you for the opportunities that you've given us in jesus name amen and remember bruce i mean they're not here today um heavy load there for them with mom right now lots of lifting lots of tugging um He's where he needs to be right now, but just remember him and Frida as they um, care for his mom. Take your hymnals, if you would, and stand. Throw this in the way or I'll sing the wrong song. Number 462. Oh, that was a prelude. Never mind. 458. some twice yep gentle shepherd gentle shepherd shepherd come and feed us for we need your strength from day to day there's no other we can turn to who can help us face another day shepherd come and lead us for we need your help to find our way do that again
actually going to lead that one. Um, where's your own uh, board up here? We were um, thinking about songs for news, which there's not a lot out there. At least in our hymnal, there's not a lot. Um, and I thought about this chorus that we used to sing a long time ago in the choir. Very, very simple little chorus. But it is full of New Year's resolutions. Because here's what it says. Lord, I want to love you more than I ever have before. You're so easy to adore. Lord, I want to love you more. That's a good resolution or a good goal, okay? And then it says, Lord, I want to serve you more, so much better than before. That's what I'm living for. Lord, I want to serve you more. And then, Lord, I want to praise you more. For the things you've done, for the things you have in store, for the things you've given me before, Lord, I want to praise you more. Three good goals. If you, you know, we make New Year's resolutions, and I don't know about you, but some of mine last about half a day, something like that. But these are three that um, I think the Lord would approve of. So, and he can help us do that. So here's what we're going to do. If you know this chorus, sing it with me the first time through. If you don't know it, by the first time through, you will know it. Then you can sing it with me. So we'll do it twice, and here's what it sounds like. first verse together. Here we go. Lord, I want to love you more than I ever have before. You're so easy to adore. Lord, I want to love you more. Okay, now here's verse number two. this is this your goal if it is this can be your prayer to him 
got here just a little bit late. The pastor's out of town. Brother Paul Whitten is going to be bringing the message today. And his family is going to sing for us this morning. When I found out that he's coming, I sent him a message and said, hey, do a special for us. Or two. Or five. How is everybody? Good? You need to be smiling out there. Everybody, get, everybody it's, it's a new year, right? Uh, I had somebody tell me the other day that uh, this is 2022, T-O-O as well. And uh, there's so many things going on. You, you think about it, we're all sitting here. I just took my coat off because it's hot. And in about 12 hours, where I'm going to need my coat back. Uh, and it's it's going to turn. It's going to go from summer to winter. It's not. Gonna, it's going to miss fall today, and we're going from summer to winter immediately. And uh, I was thinking about all the the things that about the new year. And this is a song, by the way. When I started, when I first heard this song, it kind of ruined me from being able to hear "Auld Lang Syne" without thinking about these words. So I'm actually going to do it to you too, to where from now on, every time you hear "Auld Lang Syne," you're going to think of these words. But when I heard this song, I thought it was a great song for uh, this time of year. So listen to the words of it. Your grace will never be forgot. Your mercy Show. 
you know this song. Uh, of course, it's a little bit different than what you're used to, but uh, uh, I think this is an actually an appropriate song to sing this time of year, too. Uh, you can remember it as it is well with my soul. Of course, it's a little different, but listen to the, uh, listen to the words. Uh, Peace. 
All right, ever. Are you awake? You are now. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 18. Isaiah 43, verse number 18 is going to be my main text today. Everybody take your Bibles and turn there. How many of you are wearing a new pair of shoes that you got for Christmas? Anybody? Yeah, look at you. Some of you are wearing new clothes. Most of you have gotten either one of two things this year for Christmas. You either got a new Georgia shirt or an Alabama shirt. <laughs> Which one did you get? I know my son-in-law got a Georgia and I got an Alabama, so we're, we're uh, house divided right now. Uh, Friday was a tough day in our household. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 18. Isaiah 43, 18. We're going to talk about the new things. I got a new grill for Christmas, and my wife got a new couch, and we got some new, new things. And, and as you think about Christmas, and it is, it's about, can you imagine uh, your wife going, and, and I don't know if they've ever done this to you or not, and I, I, this could be a good joke if somebody did it, just go and just wrap up one of your old pair of shoes and put under the tree or take your, you know, your car keys from your car that you've got 200,000 miles on, just put in a box. And, and uh, I've often, you know, thought about what that would be like. And, and all the things that we like to, at the end of this year, at Christmas, it's kind of neat to see that there's, it's all about new. It's all about something that's new that's come along. And you think about it this time of year where we, uh, yesterday, we, we brought, it was the first, it was the first day of the year. And so you're here, you're actually on the first church service of the year you actually came to church as a lot of people said oh we'll wait and my new year's resolution to go to church this year will start next sunday uh and as bill said if any of you made resolutions to go to sunday school more this year you missed today so um but isaiah chapter 43 verse number 18 remember you not the former things neither uh, consider the things of old verse number 19 behold i will do a new thing now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even, now I like this right here. I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You can be seated. Um, as I think about this passage of scripture, we ask ourselves, what, what defines the wilderness? Uh, you know, we, me and Bill were talking about uh, when, I was a, when I was a teenager in this church, uh, we took trips to Jack's River. If you've never been to Jack's River, you've missed something that's really close to here. <laughs> and uh, it's up in the Cahuta Wilderness, and we would take the, the Beach Bottom Trail down to the to Jack's River Falls. And, and we did all this. But what makes the Cahuta Wilderness a wilderness is the fact that when you start going into the wilderness, you go off the asphalt. Uh, there are no real what you would consider roads. It's actually the end of Georgia Highway 2, believe it or not, but it turns into just dirt. And uh, wilderness means there are no pathways. Well, that's the definition of the, the word wilderness is that there, you know, you go into the wilderness and uh, I, actually I've been out driven several times now to, uh, to where Macy and Brett and the grandkids live in uh, in. Um, California, San Diego, uh, actually on the, the Marine base there in California. And if you drive 
out that way, you see a lot of wilderness. You see a lot of places where you look off the interstate, you look north up toward or look south toward the border, and as you're going across, you think, wow, there's nothing here. There's no roads as you go through Devil's Canyon and you go through the part of Arizona that you go through. It just seems like forever there's just nothing. This scripture is actually telling us that in places where it is that desolate, in things where it is that, where there are not supposed to be things, where things are supposed to be bleak, where things are not supposed to exist, God says, and I like this word here, if you look in, in scripture, I, I underlined it here, the word even. And if you think about this, God even. Uh, aren't you glad that Scripture actually sometimes will tell us, look, that, that God is going to even do something. He's going to do something that, that you have to use some, some pronouns or you have to uh, actually adjectives that actually s- express something more than just the normal thing. That God is even going to make pathways. He's going to make a way in the wilderness. So in places where, and if you think about it in our lives in this country right now, and not just in this country, but in this whole world, it seems like there's a lot of things that are, would be considered wilderness. A lot of things that would be considered where there's no way, there's no path to this, there's no direction to this. And, and, and I think the last time I preached here a couple of months ago, we talked about this where you know the world is telling us now that this is going to be the end of the church. That this is going to be the end of it because uh, coronavirus and all of this pandemic and everybody being gone so much and all of this that it's actually going, people are just not going to come back. You know what I believe is I believe God can and will make a path in that wilderness. That I believe that God can bring it back and God will bring it back because God promised us that His church would exist. God promised us that He would not leave it, that He would not let it down. And so here you are sitting in a, in a, in a place where they said that this would die. And here you are sitting at first Sunday in, in uh, 2022. You're sitting in this sanctuary and you're here and it's not dead. It's, you're, it's very much alive in use. And, and I see it in your faces. I see that, it's, that you are here because you woke up this morning, you got ready and you came here because you know that there's something alive, that there's something going on that God is doing in this place got one amen out of that I need some more somebody say amen all right there we go and then also what is the definition of a desert definition of desert is last lack of water definition of a desert is there's lack of rivers in this it's actually saying there's lack of and if you see a river uh, that going through the desert what is usually around that river not desert <laughs> usually at least to some degree outside of that river there is growth because it is the sustenance that 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 the desert needs to have that river running through it now think about this for just a moment in places where that we have come to place where it is nothing but death where it's nothing but things that cannot grow, things that cannot be alive, God is saying, look, I'm going to bring life. Places where it can, the new thing that I'm going to do in you is I'm going to bring life into a place, life into an environment where everyone else says nothing can grow here. Now, I want to tell you, that's important for us in this time of year. That's important for us because so many times in our life, especially in these last couple of years, Everybody, and, and you think about it, everybody's talking about how bad uh, these last couple of years have been with all the things that are happening and, and all of the now, it's, 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 it's still the coronavirus, but now it's inflation and, and all of this stuff that's happening and, and all of this uh, angst and all of this between us and the different things that are going on in the government, all of this different things that's happening. And in a lot of ways, we look at it and we think, well, you know, How's it going to come back? How's it going to be life? God is saying, look, I will bring life. I will cause it to bloom. I will cause it to grow in places where you said it will never be. So in your resolutions, in the things that in your life, and and it's interesting how many times, and uh, I'm not knocking the people I've talked to, but I have yet to have anyone tell me I've made resolutions this year. Now, every year in the past, I've gone and I've asked people, hey, what are you, what's your revolu- resolution for this, for this year? And, and a lot of people say, oh, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to work out more. I'm going to do more. Everybody I've spoken to that I've asked this question to in the last couple of weeks, people that I've worked with and people that, that are customers and different things like that, not a single one has said, I'm going to, do, I'm going to make this resolution. And so I started asking myself the question when I got to studying this, why? Is it because we've lost hope? Is it because we've, we've gone and said, ah, it's not even worth it anymore in the environment in which we live? You know, I want to tell you something. God is saying that this is what He is willing. As you see, it, when it's unlikely, God creates something new. This is why we can trust Him when it seems impossible. We just celebrated Christmas, right? That immaculate conception. The, the famous words that were said to Him that with man this could be impossible. With God, what did He say? Nothing is impossible. 
And so what this is saying is, is that the unlikelihood, and again, I don't know if you disagree with this, you have a right to be wrong. <laughs> but in this, that God could take the most unlikely situation, the unnatural, the miraculous, and take a virgin girl and bring God into this earth, a lowly young girl that no one, she was off the map, that hardly anybody knew about. And bring her and use that vessel to be the one that brings God to this earth. That seems impossible, doesn't it? So when you think about the fact that God can do this impossible, I want you to look at a couple of things. I've got four new things I want us to look at. Number one, we're going to go back. We're going to go back in in Scripture. We're going to go back in time to Jeremiah 31, verse number 31. It's there on your screen. Jeremiah 31, verse number 31, there's a new covenant. And behold, it says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, you remember when Jesus was at the Last Supper. Now, listen close. I've got to preach fast here. We're going to be here all day. So listen close. Remember when Jesus was at the Last Supper and he was looking at his disciples. He was speaking to them in Matthew 26, verse number 28. He says this, For this is my blood of the New Testament. Now, some of you may, this may be something new to you, but the testament, the word testament simply means covenant. And so we think about the Old Testament, New Testament. To us, we think about it as, as, you know, part of the Bible and the other part of the Bible. We just call it the testament. We think it's just a definition for it. It's actually talking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is what it's talking about. It's not just a testament that's just a, well, testament means book, book. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying this part of the Bible, which was, you know, a larger chunk than the other part. But this part of the Bible is talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and this part is talking about the New. And when Jesus was feeding His disciples, and when He was the Lord of the ceremony during this, this, uh, this Seder, this Passover meal that He was actually doing, what Jesus was actually saying was, is this is when the New Covenant is going to begin. Now, a lot of people fight about when did the new covenant begin? Did it begin at that moment? Did it begin at the death? Did it begin? When did it begin? Did it begin when, when the Holy Spirit moved on the people? When did, when did the new covenant begin? All I know is that Jesus was the one that initiated the new covenant. He was the one that brought it into existence. And so with this, he's saying that when you drink of this fruit of the vine and it represents my blood, understand this. Every time you do that, and that's why it's important when we do communion in church. It's important for us to understand that this is not something that, and sometimes growing up, I remember looking at this little thing of juice, and, and now it's actually different because of the, the, actually, I think coronavirus has brought it most of the way home, but I don't know if y'all do this, but there, it's all in a package now. Uh, we took a communion at, at the, the church that I play guitar for right now, and, and uh, they actually you peel the top part off, and you get the little bread out. And I think it's styrofoam. I'm not sure that's bread. But then you, you pull the other part off and, and it's, uh, it's grape juice. And that is definitely not grape juice. <laughs> uh, it, is, it is something else. But, but in it, what it represents is, and so as I'm sitting there, and this was the Christmas Eve service, and as I'm sitting in this Christmas Eve service, and we are doing this to represent what Jesus was doing at this Last Supper, it's not something to play around with. It's not something to just take lightly. It's not something to, to laugh through or whatever. Now, I'm not saying we ought to sit around and be sad. I'm saying I, this should be a joyful thing. We should have smiles on our faces, but we should take it seriously as well. We should understand that this is the definition of what was old stayed back old, and what is new is new for us. It is the new thing for us. You see, the old covenant, and get this right here, the old covenant indicated things that had to be done. You ever studied that out? Have you ever studied out what they had to do? Have you ever thought about the amount? Just just think about the the centuries of every single year on Yom Kippur, every single household brought a sacrifice that was was killed, that was slain in the process of getting redemption, getting, getting atonement for their sins. Think about the level of sacrifice that had to happen. Then you go through all of the other things that occur. If you've hurt somebody's feelings or or you've, you've actually, your mule kicked the neighbor's son and killed the neighbor's son because you're a mule. you got to go through this whole rigmarole of different sacrifices and different things you got to do. And on and on, I mean, the, it, read it, there's like 900 and something different laws that they had to abide by. You ever met an Orthodox Jew? 
They're so, they're, they're so careful about everything. They have to be because they have to, in the course of this, they have to be careful what they touch. They have to be careful what they do. And so they have to wash their hands at certain times if they're going to follow that law exactly to the T because it is so difficult. And actually God did that on purpose. Because what he was saying, when he set it up for when Jesus looked at the Pharisees, which were the most religious, the most what would be considered clean and holy people that walked the face of the earth at the time, he looked at them and was able to say, you're not following it. You're not following it. And he was able to say at that moment, there has never, read the scripture, there has never been a person that has ever followed the law straight to the T. Never. So what was God doing? Was God setting us up to fail? Was God created, God created the law that man could not do? And it was impossible for man to do? I remember in school, we had a girl named Kristen Stubeck. And she was my, the nemesis of the entire class. Because what Kristen did is Kristen made a hundred on everything. Everything. She was perfect on everything that she did. You know what that did for people like me? It ruined the curve. Right? You remember that. Some of you either were that person. (laughs) Get out of my class. No, I'm just kidding. You were either that person or you experienced it where you had the perfect student. And that perfect student was the one that when the teacher would just, oh, that's the other thing. The perfect student always got to stand in front of the line. The very front. I got the very back. Kirsten got, uh, got the very front, you know. And she was so, they just loved her so much. She was the one that would bring the shiny apple <laughs> to the teacher. You know, there was not, God is saying there is not a teacher's pet here. God is saying that there is not a perfect one that has ever come. And then what he said was, I'm going to take that miraculous moment that we just celebrated just a little bit ago, right? I'm going to take that miraculous moment and I'm going to bring into the world the only one that ever will and ever could be perfect. And when I bring that one that will ever will, and, and, and that is the one that what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that old covenant and I'm going to have everyone realize that for all of these centuries, for all these millennia, We have failed. All of this we have failed and we have tried and we have tried, but we have failed. But And the only way to succeed is Him. That's the only way for it to be successful. You see, the new one is based on things that have already been done. Have you ever thought about that Philippian jailer? Ever thought about this guy? Remember the story, right? Paul and all of them, they were, I'm going to try to move quickly. They were in jail. The angel came and let them out. And all of a sudden, as the, all the doors were open and the Philippian jailer thought he was going to die, and so he fell to his knees and says, Lord, you know, God, what must I do to be saved? Now, at this point, the disciples understood, the apostles understood that he was not referring to his life, he was referring to his soul, or they wouldn't have said this. They realized that he was saying, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? You know, some people, I, pre, I believe, preach this erroneously in the fact they're saying, oh, what he's trying to do is, you know, save his own skin. I don't believe that. I believe the disciples knew that he was saying, what must I do to have what you got? You ever wonder what was going through his mind? You ever wonder what he was expecting them to say? He's fell to his knees. The doors are all open. Here comes all the prisoners out. And he falls to his knees and he says, what must I do to be saved? Have you ever wondered what he thought they were going to say? Well, what you got to do is you got to go do 15 Hail Marys and you got to, you know, quote this catechism and you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to go kill a bunch of lambs, you got to do, you know, and this, what do you think he expected them to say? In the, in the environment in which he lived, there were going to be some pretty extremes right there. Remember now, he was in the place where God, the goddess Diana was actually the, the god of the day. And she was, the, she was the goddess that would have been the one that you had to do some pretty strange sacrifices for. And I'm not going to go into detail because we're in mixed company. He would have been used to those kind of things. And then he would have also known a little bit about the law. And he would have known that, the, that all the things, he would have seen those guys walking around with the phylacteries. You know what I'm talking about? The little, the little leather boxes on their foreheads. The little leather boxes on their arms. With the, with the little curlies in their hair. You know what I'm talking about? And with the... With the with the tallits on and on and on it goes. He would have seen those and he would have thought, well, I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> what did he say to him? What did Paul say to him? 
Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. That's it. You don't have to worry about the Old Testament anymore. Now it's the New Testament. It is now it is the New Covenant. This is hard for the world to grasp. This is why that we have to fight to get people to come to church. It's because it's hard for us to grasp the fact that this is truly, 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 truly just a free gift and God doesn't expect anything in return. Man, that's so hard for us. Even today, you see something that says free gift. You know what that free gift means? That free gift means that if you do something and you buy something big, we'll give you something small as a free gift along with it. <laughs> right? Saw something the other day where if you, if you buy a car, you get, and I don't even remember what it was, but you get some kind of free gift. And I looked at it and I thought, well, that would be kind of cool, but I don't want to spend $42,000 on a car just to get the free gift. You know, sometimes in our society, if we're not careful, if we're, especially some preachers, some preachers make people believe that, that you've got to give $42,000 to the church, then we'll give you the free gift of salvation. <laughs> no. That's not how that works. It's a hard concept. But let me ask you something. If your family gave up a son for a purpose, would you make people pay for it? <clears throat> Think about that. If your family gave up a son to die a cruel death like something on a cross, would you make people pay for it? What if it was for the cure for cancer? And in the course of this, you ran into one of the recipients of this cure for cancer and they're smoking a cigarette. How would you feel? How would you react? Well, you would definitely not react the way God does. I know I wouldn't. I'd be all over them. I gave my son, my son died a cruel death, your, your humanity's hands, and now you're out doing the same thing that he redeemed you from? From? What a horrible thing to think about. You know what I would do? I would say, mm, give it back. You know, there's a lot of people that believe that, but God says, no, it's without repentance. That I don't give it, I don't take it back. And God's saying, look, no matter how much you think it is going to cost you, it only cost my son. It only cost my family. Romans 5.15 says it this way, but not as the offense. There's the word, offense. Oh, isn't that a big word today? You're offended by everything. I mean, uh, you just, and now we're seeing it even more so because of social media or whatever. Somebody goes and does something, somebody somewhere, and somebody takes a picture of them, puts it on social media and says, that offends me. You know, and I want to go ahead and say this to you. If you're one of those type of people, and I'm just going to make this statement, being offended doesn't make you right. You know, I mean, then that's in society, that's what we think. If I get offended, then all of a sudden I've got a purpose. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're, the way you're offended does not mean that you're necessarily right. But you see this offense, so also is, here it is, the free gift. For if through the offense of one, remember Adam, many be dead. One person, and, and have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how, uh, you know, you go all the way back to the, what is the big deal about a piece of fruit? What is the big deal? If you're from the outside looking in, you're a lost person, and you read the story, and you, and you don't read the rest of the story, you're thinking, what is the big deal? God put this tree in the garden and said, don't eat of it, and they ate of it, and then now all of a sudden all this mess has happened. What we don't realize is, is that was just a disobedience to God. Do you all understand within a very short amount of time in Scripture that one of the next offenses was one brother killing another brother? Fratricide. <laughs> What a, in one of the most heinous sins that you could possibly think about it. The offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, has abounded unto many. Many died, Christ saved many. So, the new covenant. Now, I want you to look at the next thing, the new creation. This is when it becomes applicable. This is when it applies to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it this way, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, you know the, you know the verse, right? You can quote it for me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Some of your translations have the word creation right there. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, there's an interesting thing because if you study out, and I, I just read it out of the King James Version, but if you study it out on all the different translations and you really study it out from the beginning, that word are is correct. Wait a minute. It should say have become new and sometimes if we most of the time we accidentally quote it with all things have become new but it's correct to say are 
Well, because of what it's doing is it's putting in the present tense. It's taking it out of the past tense and putting it into the present. All things right now are becoming new. You see, new creation, old things are completely gone, and all things are become, become completely new. Now, here's something we have to be careful about. Because if I'm not careful, I will preach a message here that will make you think that when you get saved, you've got you, you to gotta be perfect. <laughs> you've got to go and now you've got to sit right here and you've got to be you know, perfect. It's, um, I, that's not what I'm saying in this, but I am saying that this is not a remodel. And sometimes if we're not careful, we will, cr- we will make it so, it's so easy for someone to come to salvation and we'll make it to where it's just so, you know, repeat this prayer to me, blah, 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 and all that stuff where it's just like if you feel like it, you should do it. And we leave the Holy Spirit out of this sometimes if we're not careful because this is a total transformation. This isn't God adding a salvation to your, to your repertoire of things you have in your life. This is God saying you are completely remodeled. You, I'm not remodeled, completely made new. Sorry, this is not a remodel. This is out of a nothing existence, a God-level type creation. You remember this, right? God can do that. And so many times, if we're not careful, we will see someone come to repentance, whether it's for salvation or whether it's truly just repenting for a sin that they've done, that they've committed, and we will hold back a little bit. And we'll say, oh, let's just wait and see. We're going to be careful of that because we're not treating them the way God treats them. Because when someone truly comes to repentance, at that point, God is saying, look, New creation. A new creation right here and now. That person that, that came to the altar and they carried all their sins to this altar, when they got up and they truly repented, they left them there and they're a different person walking back to their pew. You see, in the same way God spoke into, into complete darkness and said, let there be light, He speaks new life into existence. That's why the first Nick at night, <laughs> when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and he started asking him about eternal life, Jesus started throwing out terms that were very confusing to him. He said, you must be, and use this term, born again. Born again. And what did Nicodemus say? Wait a minute. Can a man, when he is old, enter in back into the womb and be born a second time? What did Jesus say? I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about spiritual. Now, we've got to be careful here because sometimes if we're not careful, we will take the spiritual and we'll make it less reality than we do the physical. I want to change, I want to flip that narrative for you for just a second. Please understand this. You're going to live the spiritual for eternity. You're going to live the physical until you're, we thought Betty White was going to make it to 100 and she didn't. Think about this. Sometimes we live in the physical and that's the main, that's the reality. When the truth of the matter is that the spiritual is more reality than the physical. Because the spiritual is eternal. The spiritual is going to last forever. And so when Nicodemus was confused, Jesus said to him, that which is born of the spirit is spirit and that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Remember he said that to him? What he's saying is, is that you better get in spirit mode right here. Because if you don't get in spirit mode, you know what happens if you don't ever get into spirit mode? You go to hell. I know that's tough, but it's just true. Your physical, if all you live is the physical, your physical is going to die, both physically and spiritually. And so in this, he's speaking about a new thing. And then moving quickly, I've got four minutes to preach two more points. Y'all ready? (laughs) New compassions. Now, some of your versions use the word mercies here, which works. It's out of Lamentations. (laughs) <laughs> that's a, that's a, a book for us right now, isn't it? Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. What that says is, is that in the course of a 24-hour period, His compassion for us renews. Think about this for a moment. So that means that if I've really done something to anger God, tomorrow morning he's going to be cool with it. Oh, wait a minute. Does that mean that he's said, oh, and I'm not preaching liberalism right here. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is is he's able to forgive that quickly. Does he still judge? And we've got to be careful here because there's still consequences of sin, right? 
And that's consequences of sin. Sometimes we think, oh, God is, is judging me. No, God is saying, you, get, you got what I warned you about. The Ten Commandments is not a, it's not a, 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 a list of rules. Ten Commandments is alts and alt nots that God tells us. Things we shouldn't and should do, should and shouldn't do. That's what that is. Things that, that should not happen in our lives because if it does, there's natural consequences to this. You lie, there's going to be a natural consequence. You do this, there's going to be natural consequences to this because of the whole process of you were created to be in the image of Christ, in the image of God. And so because of that, when you don't do that, there's going to be some consequences. It's just going to happen. And we'll say, oh God, why are you doing this to me? No, God's saying, look, you did it to yourself. How many times have we seen people shake their fist at God and say, God, I can't believe that you would cause good people to die. And God says, I didn't cause death. I'm not the one that brought death into this world. You read the passage a little bit earlier. God said that was us. That was us that brought. God created us to never die. That was the intention. He also created us to obey Him for eternity, and we didn't do that either. (laughs) You see, but it says this, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. This thing's making noise over here. The Scripture never said Jesus has compassion. Think about this. Scripture never said Jesus had compassion. Every single time it talks about the compassion of Christ, it uses the words, He was moved with compassion. You know what that means? Macy, when she was little, she was probably about Ashton Grace's age. She was being watched by one of our church members while we were, I don't remember what we were doing. This is when we were in Tekoa. And uh, we got a phone call, and it was, she, the woman was just frantic. She said, oh, no, I've slammed Macy's finger in the door of the car. And Macy gives us a description that Macy's always been the kind of person that the, the wreck that she had, the car was upside down. And when we got to the, when we got to the wreck, she's sitting on the bumper. <laughs> and the paramedic is saying, he's trying to clean her up, and he's like trying to fix a wound. And she says, well, where did you do this? She said, oh, I did that three days ago. <laughs> and so it wasn't part of the wreck. So that's the kind of life. But So she's holding her finger up, and part of it is gone. Remember that? Is it still gone? You still got part of your finger gone. She's holding it up, and she's like, it didn't hurt. <laughs> but the story goes is that she slammed the finger in the door, and the door closed all the way with her finger in there. Now imagine yourself in that condition. Imagine yourself in that situation. And you, 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 someone walks up and sees this four-year-old girl or you with your finger stuck in the door with it locked, with it closed. People gather around and have a prayer vigil for you. Oh dear Lord, please help your child as their finger is stuck in this door. Remember in James when James talked to the church in Jerusalem and he told them, look, you walk by somebody that's hungry and and naked and you look at them and say, I'm going to pray that you're full and clothed when you've got a coat on. (laughs) You know, in that situation, you don't stop and pray. You don't stop and and, and have compassion, pat the little child on on the shoulder and say, oh, how bad is it that you got your finger stuck in the door? No, what do you do? You open the door. That's what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't do like sometimes we do and say, oh, look at those people that are, that are not, that, that don't have what we have and they don't, you know, and he doesn't look down from heaven and say, oh man, I feel so sorry for them. And that's not what Jesus does. God doesn't feel sorry for you. He moved, he's moved with compassion for you. He acts. There's activity involved. You see, we have a God that is continually moved into action by his compassion for us. You see, this is comforting in a world where it's easy to find hate. This knowledge overcomes the current pessimism we feel in our world. And I'm not going to get to the very last point, but I do want you to hear this one. Not only, now think about all these points. Not only do we have a new covenant and a new creation and new compassions, but because of all of this, we have a new song. We have a new song. We sing differently. That's why it's disheartening sometimes, and I haven't seen it much here today, <laughs> but it's disheartening to come into to sanctuaries in churches, and they've, this is the scenario in which we are living, and we see people in church going, I'm here today. 
You know what that tells me about us? I've done it myself, is I've forgotten this scenario. I've forgotten that there was a new covenant that did the old covenant away and it gave me a free gift. I have forgotten that because of that I became a new creature. Not a, not a remodel, not the, a version of my old self, but I became a completely new creation. I became completely new. And so because of that, every day I find new compassions coming from my God. And He is not, just doesn't feel sorry for me. He's not looking down from heaven like some cosmic killjoy looking down saying, Oh, that poor person, you know, what a bad situation they're in. No, He does something about it. He's moved with compassion. And so because of that, you know what that tells me? I have a reason to do to sing. I have a reason for things to be different. You see, our, our hearts sing a different song than it ever could before. The old song was a song about hopelessness, about bondage to sin, about fear, about no purpose, and on and on and on it goes. It was the worst country song you've ever sung. <laughs> the dog died. The wife left. On and on it goes. I'm sorry, most of y'all really like country. I probably do. <laughs> Grandma went to jail. This song is completely different. The song of the redeemed is completely different from the song of the unredeemed. Completely different. That's why when you go to work and, and the world is falling apart and you still have joy in your heart and you still have hope in your life, the, the world around you, the people around you wonder what in the world is wrong with you? Why are you so joyful? It's only there because he put it there. Now I'm going to get to the last point. Why is all of this possible? Revelation 21, verse number 5, we come down to the very end of it all. Very end of all of this, and we're starting the, the beginning of eternity that we consider eternity. Remember what Jesus said, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. It's because of Christ. So, 2022. In 2022, we've got a new opportunity. And sometimes in our life, and, and if we're not careful, I'm preaching to the, those of you that chose to get up this morning and come to church, so more than likely, you're redeemed. <laughs> if you're not, please, please, this is the day of salvation. If you, if you have not been redeemed, please, now, now, right now, don't even, don't, don't even let the Satan get in your mind at this moment. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you now. Make sure it's the Holy Spirit and not your emotions. Because if it's your emotions and not the Holy Spirit, we're not doing it right. But if you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and you come for salvation, this is the moment. But for the rest of us that came here, this was a message that kind of geared towards salvation. But let me tell you something. Stop mully grubbing. Stop it. Stop talking about how the world is coming to an end, how everything is so horrible. Stop it. You have a hope in Christ. You have a reason to sing. You have a reason to be joyful. You have a song that you weren't singing before that you're singing now. Don't let it die. Don't be like the children of Israel that when they said, sing a song of Israel, and they said, we can't sing a song of Israel in a strange land. You're not in a strange land. You're with Christ. You're in Him. And yeah, you're, in, you're, a, you're a, a pilgrim. Of course you are. But in this, you are at home in Christ and you have a reason. Father, thank you so much for what's new. Thank you so much for what has been brought by you. Thank you that we can look into the Old Testament and see a form that we were not able to truly follow. And then we look into the New Testament, the New Covenant, and we find something completely new. Father, we thank you that that in itself makes us a new creation with a simple understanding that it's just a free gift. And then, Father, we come find your compassions. And it gives us a reason to sing. Father, maybe someone in this room that's been looking out at 2022 and haven't been very optimistic about what's happening next. Seems like the news and the media and all the, the voices we hear is pointing us toward doom and gloom when the truth of the matter is, is that you're still God. 
and you still are moved with compassion and you still are bringing people into the new covenant and creating new people. So Father, help us as new creations to act like it. Help us as new creations to set those resolutions in our hearts in faith. To say, this this is how I want to live in 2022. And I want it to be closer in the likeness of Christ than it was in 2021. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to preach to these people today. I pray that you bless them. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Open your hymnals to 210. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. He has paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed. It white as Thank y'all so much. Thank you, Brother Paul, for the for the message and your family. That was um have such sweet harmony. Um and that one right there in training that was doing a pretty good job harmonizing with them too. Macy Aspen Grace. Aspen. She was sounding good back there. She really was. Thank y'all for coming. Um, good to see every one of you this morning. Pray for our pastor as he's out of town. Um, be back Wednesday night. Starting this Wednesday night, we're going to have a class for K or four through K. And of course, we already have our kids link, which we are learning the Bible. We're memorizing Bible verses. The kids are walking away knowing something from this class. Um, the youth will be meeting upstairs. Sister Jamie, she's working through the Bible with them. Lots of new, lots of good things going on. Sunday school, every Sunday morning at 10, either in here. If you want to do it remotely, I can send you a Zoom link. Find what it is that God has for you to do here and do it. Paul was talking about this renewal. Paul was talking about how God comes in and he creates new from blackness and from darkness. And um, I, I listened to a, a Christian comedian this week, um, and, and he described it as, you know, we hear Jesus knocking on the door and we'll step out when we need something. And we'll say, hey, um, I need a car. Um, I need to get a good grade, um, I need a wife, I need a husband, you know, something. And then we close the door back. We just, he's just our cosmic um, ATM. We just want to slide the card through and, and punch in what we want and him give it to us. But he said, we got to let him in. And when we let him in, don't just let him in the good room of the house that's the room you know in the front that you keep cl closed off and you don't let anybody go in there except for special times you let him in and then he brings in a contractor called the holy spirit and he tears out walls and opens up doors he creates new in that place he cleans out throws away all that old junk and brings a new life into that home and he opens up there ain't no places in there that he's not allowed when you are fully open to him if you've got a relationship with God where it's just a, a guy told me just right down this road one night when I was at his house on visitation I, I said his name half of you know who I was talking about he said well God and I've got this agreement just kind of a 60 40 kind of thing you know and, um, and he's good with that and I wasn't intelligent enough at the time to respond, but the answer to that is yes. He will second the motion and allow you to go the wrong way. So he's right. 
God's good with it. He's not great with it. But if you choose to just make God maybe 40, maybe 60% of your life, but, you know, well, he's not going to change my radio station. You know, I like what I like, and that's just all there is. He's not going to change what I like to eat, drink, whatever. He may want to change everything in your world. He may want to turn you so upside down. I don't know. You might end up wearing fishing shirts all the time. Who knows what might happen to you, you know. Um, get a vest. You know, wear a wear a, a, a hobby vest or something. Oh, that's me. Anyhow, love y'all. Come back Wednesday night. Um, be careful. The coronavirus is still a problem. Um, Georgia hit the highest number of positive cases it's hit since the virus started. Now, granted, it doesn't seem to be affecting people as bad, but the long-term effects of this stuff is still unknown. Um, so be careful. Love you. Have a good day. And don't forget the offering plates. Thank you.